I'll just uh, start the discussion. Uh, thank you everyone for joining in the call on Saturday morning. Uh, thank you, Shiv sir, for uh, joining and uh, uh, sharing your views on the with our clients. I'll start first start with the introduction of our speaker uh, for the benefit of our audience. Mr. Uh, Shiv Chenani is a senior fund manager equity at Baroda BNP Paribas Mutual Fund. He has an overall work experience of 23 years in Indian equities and has spent considerable time on equity research, both on institutional broking as well as investment management, donning the roles from research associate to lead analyst to head of research. Furthermore, he has also been a strategist providing the top-down view during his stint. The two put together has enabled him to lead, look at the portfolio construction through a mix of top-down macro view as well as bottom-up company-specific calls. Uh, furthermore, he has spent a couple of years in a uh, couple of years in New York and Hong Kong, thus widening his perspective and looking at the company's businesses in global context. Career-wise, he has spent more than 15 years in investment management across organizations such as Nippon Mutual Fund, Sundaram Mutual Fund, and E-Fund Management. He has actively managed international investments across markets ranging from Japan to Brazil. In the Indian markets, he managed various multi-cap strategies across diversified and thematic funds. He has also been head of research and strategist in various organizations, both on the sell side as well as buy side, giving him a complete 360 degree view. Uh, his previous job was at LRA Securities as head of equity research, uh, Sundara Mutual Fund, Reliance Mutual Fund and ICICI Securities. Academically, he has completed his PGDM from IM Bangalore and he is also a CFA charter holder from CFA Institute. Uh, he has managed Sundaram Large and Mid-Cap Fund from 13 to 17 and during his tenure, the fund was in the top quartile range across, uh, across the time frame. Uh, he is currently managing more than 2600 crores across three funds, uh, BNP Paribas Mid-Cap, consumption and business cycle fund. Uh, thank you, Shiv sir, for joining in. Um, Thanks in a lot, Aditya, for the time our clients. Um, so, uh, we'll first start with a few uh, questions on market outlook, market and economy outlook and your thoughts on that. Sure. Uh, the first obvious question that everyone has that uh, uh, we have seen a very sharp broader market rally over the last six months. Uh, so, what what is your take and your fund house take on the valuations placed across different sectors and different market caps? Right, great, uh, Aditya. I think again, thanks a lot. Uh, you know, for those kind words, and thanks everyone for joining today on a Saturday morning. I'm sure all of you have a you know lot more to catch up from a family and friends perspective. In spite of that, you chose to be here. So thanks a lot to everyone. Uh, yeah, so I think, Aditya, that's a great question. And I think that's at the top of everybody's mind that, uh, uh, you know, market briefly crossed 20,000 Nifty. Uh, broadly, it's hovering around new highs. So, you know, how should we look at it? Uh, whether the valuations are expensive and things like that. Right? So, you know, one thing that... Uh, we have always been saying is that never be afraid of new highs, right? Because, you know, if the market doesn't make new high, we are not going to make money at the end of the day, right? So for us to make money over a longer period of time, the market has to make new highs. We are at 20,000 right now. And in five years time frame, if the Nifty doesn't hit 35,000, we are not going to make, uh, you know, like double digit CAGR returns, right? So by default, the market has to scale new highs. That That's something which is given. But having said that, also it's important to put the new high in the context, right? So like I was talking to somebody yesterday and, uh, you know, we were discussing that how in the in 2008, 
the market was scaling up thousand points like every month or second month kind of thing uh you know or every two weeks kind of a thing right yes you know if the market hits new high high you know from that point of a view that you know it is going up thousand points every second week we should be worried but if we put the current new high in the context that uh we were around 18000 you know 2 years back so we are just about 18000 to 20000 in 2 years time which is hardly a 5% cas here so you know there is no euphoria you know by any stretch of imaginations correct right? so from that point of view uh, we really don't think that you know one should be worried about whether the market is overvalued just because it is hitting a new high I'm sure, you know, like all of us read a lot of news headlines and, you know, uh, the media, the CNBC of the world where, you know, everybody will be talking about, you know, that phrase called new high, but we need to put it in the context. So the, you know, uh, some and substance of it is that, you know, market is broadly trading at, let's say somewhere around 17 and a half times earnings on a 525 basis. I'm sorry, just give me one minute. Uh, sorry for this interruption, just one minute. So uh, we will just resume in a minute. Meanwhile, the if audience has yeah, sorry, I am back. Yeah, sure, sir. Please, please I, go I'm ahead. I'm really sorry for this interruption. No, no, uh, no problem, sir. Please go ahead. So uh, I was. Can you put the camera? About... That's fine, sir. Please go ahead. Yeah. So I was talking about, you know, the valuations part of it. If you look at the valuations, uh, Nifty 50 is trading somewhere around 17, 17 and a half times P on FI 25 basis, right? So clearly by no stretch of imagination, can we say that, you know, the market is overvalued or, you know, it is in a bubble zone. See, there will always be pockets of overvaluations in any kind of a market for that matter, right? But is there is a broad brushed, um, you know, uh, bubble? Certainly not. Again, just to put things in a little bit of a context, uh, think about HDFC Bank, okay? Uh, yes, there are the short-term issues, transition, you know, merger, all those kind of things. But let's put that apart for a moment. And when we look at an absolute valuations of HDFC Bank, it is trading at somewhere around 15 times PE on FY25 basis. Now think sure. about it that the largest private bank of the country is available at 15 times PE. I mean, can we call it being, you know, in a bubble zone or an overvalued zone by any stretch of imagination? Clearly not, right? So the basic point is that, you know, market is not ridiculously cheap, but at the same time, it's certainly not overvalued and we are in a, you know, in line with a long-term average. So broadly, we are fairly comfortable at the levels of the market and we are not worried. Right, right, sir. Uh, and sir, uh, what what are the, because uh, in market, we always look uh, forward looking and what are the estimates on the earnings side and uh, how, how does that placed out and what's the outlook over there on the corporate earnings? So, as I said, uh, you know, the market is broadly trading around 17 and a half times on FY25 numbers. And in terms of the earnings growth, if we look at it, you know, broadly the expectation is around 12 to 13% CAGR in earnings from FY23 to 25. 
which you would admit is that you know it's a fair number given the fact that you know we are talking about gdp growth the nominal gdp growth anywhere between 10 to 11% kind of a number right uh, i mean 6 to 7% real uh, real gdp growth 4 to 5% kind of an inflation number 10 to 11% is where the indian nominal gdp uh, growth will be and you know if the nominal gdp grows at 10 11% 12% kind of a profit growth is not a big task to achieve right right um, and so just looking at some macro uh, macro points uh, wh what is your view on the interest rates uh, and government uh, uh, going in the rates next rate cycle we also saw, saw that yesterday uh, there was a news that jp morgan is including indian government bonds in their index uh, which would potentially uh, add to dollar flows in the indian market so uh, what's what's your view on on the same so yeah, I think rates is something which is uh, at the top of everybody's mind uh, in terms of, uh, you know, where they are headed. Uh, to be honest, at least to us, it looks like even the central bankers are not sure where they are headed in the short term. Uh, they are also playing it by the ear. Uh, there are incoming data that everybody is looking at it. Uh, if you look at the UK, uh, I think uh, three days ago, everybody was very sure that, you know, UK will go ahead and raise the rates, the ECB. Uh, but the inflation numbers came a little lower than expected and then they decided to watch. If you look at the US, you know, I don't know, at least to me, the commentary sounds anything but, you know, confusing that they also don't know whether, you know, uh, there is a rate hike coming or not coming. So everybody sort of, uh, you know, hedging their bets, which is to be expected. See, uh, you know, let's understand one thing. Okay. We are in a scenario where we know that the peak rate is somewhere in the site. Okay. It's just that we don't know whether the peak rate is the current rate, it whether it is a 25 basis point higher. Or, you know, exact quantum, we don't know, but we know that, you know, we are somewhere near that, right? And in that kind of a context, it is, you know, very natural for that indecision to come in. And hence, it is going to be a lot more data-driven, which is absolutely fine. Now, the key point is that when do we start on our journey down, right? When does the central bankers start to cut rates. I think that is what is right. a more important decision criteria as compared to whether, you know, the 25 basis point hike happens or doesn't happen. Right. And as, as things stand now, most of the central bankers are of the opinion that we are, you know, what we call higher for longer in the sense that the rate cut Everybody seems to be looking at it somewhere 12 months down the line. Q4 of calendar year 24 is when everybody is expecting the rates to start to come off. Of course, you know, again, it is still going to be data driven if the inflation rates starts to come off in a hurry. Uh, of course, you will see those uh, decisions also getting pre uh, The other factor in this is the growth right so in between there was an expectation that because the us rate uh, growth rate is slowing down in a significant manner whether the central bankers bankers will go ahead and start to cut rates even before the inflation starts to come down but again from whatever incoming data that we are seeing it doesn't look like that us is you know like what was expected earlier that there can be a recession risk in the us I don't think that we are, you know, looking at any significant or a serious recession risk in the U.S. at this point of time. So, again, the sum and substance is that we are somewhere near the peak rates. The rates are likely to stay around these levels for maybe another 12 months. And probably Q4 of next year is when we start to see the rate cuts coming off. Regarding your second point on... Uh, you know, uh, the Indian bonds getting uh, uh, 
uh, part of the JP Morgan Emerging Market Bond Index. Uh, so yes, uh, you know, again, there is still, I think, around 12 months to go before uh, they actually start to uh, you know, form part of the index. Uh, so, of course, it's a positive development, both from, uh, you know, the rates as well as from a, um, you know, dollar perspective, uh, uh, as in the currency perspective. Uh, of course, we will wait and watch in terms of, you know, how much actual flows come in. Because at that point of time, also it is going to be a function of multiple things like what are the yields at that point of time, what is the macro scenario, all those kind of things. But of course, on the margin, it's a positive thing. Uh, absolutely, sir. And that also shows the confidence in our economy. Right. Uh, uh, also, sir, so we are expecting the rate uh, rate uh, re reduction or cutting in the next three, four quarters. Um, after three, four quarters, how are you structuring your portfolios uh, in terms of value versus growth and in terms of uh, sec sectors as well? So what are the sectors that you are overweight, underweight? If you can just throw some light on it. Uh, sorry, uh, Aditya, just a minute. Shiv, is it possible for you to turn on your video? Uh, I think it's on, but uh, somehow it refuses to show up. There may be a bit of a on the video side. But I have, uh, you know, uh, put it on and it's showing the webcam also. But somehow it doesn't show up on the screen. Okay, no worries. Carry on. That's that's fine, sir. You can we can go ahead. Yeah. So I think on your question regarding, uh, you know, the value versus growth and the sectors. Right. Uh, right. So I think it's pertinent here to uh, let you know that you know I actually also manage something called a value fund, uh, which we launched around uh, three months back. Uh, so see. I think the whole debate on value versus growth from an Indian context is a little misplaced. Okay. And I will tell you the reason why. Because India is a growth market. Right. We are talking about an economy which is going to grow the highest across the largest, larger economies across the world for a long period of time, for the next three, five, seven years kind of a time frame, uh, right? And even from, when we talk from a market, equity market perspective, if I were to tell you that, you know, you we are expecting a single digit kind of a return on a CAGR basis over five year period, I'm sure everybody will be completely disappointed, right? And there is a reason, I mean, validly so. All of us are expecting double digit return from markets. In that kind of a context, to talk about value is a little bit of a misnomer. Right? The whole debate of value versus growth is far more relevant in a developed world. Where, you know, the sensitivity to interest rates on, you know, com companies like or sectors like utilities is significant. Right? But that's not the case in India. We hold some utility companies in our value fund, but we hold it because of the growth. We expect these companies will double their earnings in the next three years kind of a time frame. So in the Indian context, we are expecting even utility companies to grow at a significant pace. And in a developed market context, those companies will be lucky to grow even at a 5% CHR. So this whole debate of a value versus growth is far more relevant in a developed market compared to a market like India. In India, what we think as value is basically saying that companies where we believe that they are significantly undervalued compared to their intrinsic value. Because of whatever variety of reasons, it can be there. But that is what value means for us. Right? So, I think India is going to remain a grow, growth market. And I think everybody wants to look at growth. And actually, you know, since we are talking about value versus growth, I 
just mention it here as well that uh, we are actually uh, right now in the process of uh, launching our small cap fund which actually is the space where the growth is going to be highest in the next 3 5 7 years kind of a time of course we will discuss it a little later so Absolutely. i think that's broadly on the value versus growth kind of a uh, conundrum now coming to the uh, you know this whole sectors part of it uh, so i think uh, you know what we have been talking about is you know broadly what we call the three c's which is basically consumption credit and capital goods i think when we look at a broader you know next 3 4 5 7 years kind of a time frame we believe that you know this is something kind of a secular story for india because you know the consumption will keep growing the per capita income you know we will keep on crossing those thresholds of 2000 dollars 2500 3000 so on and so forth right so consumption is going to be a uh, you know consistent theme across the next 3 5 7 years uh, similarly capital goods we are seeing uh, what we like to call as the manufacturing renaissance in india so if you look at from an indian economy perspective uh, you know in the evolution of our economy somewhere we missed the manufacturing part of it we moved from agrarian directly to services right and it's only now that we are going back to manufacturing because of the confluence of variety of regions like you know uh, pli schemes and china plus one strategy and you know indigenization drive that we are seeing in sectors like defense etc right so again capital goods as a theme is going to be fairly consistent secular for the next 5 7 years and credit is basically an outcome of the first two you know, if the consumption grows and if the uh, capital goods grows, naturally this will lead to both retail as well as corporate credit. So these are the broadly three themes that we like on a secular basis. But of course, there are nuances to it from a shorter term perspective. So, for example, we were overweight on staples uh, because, you know, staples were seeing some kind of a tailwinds from a lower input prices but now we are seeing that you know they are going to face a little bit of a headwind from a top line perspective because the pricing growth is no longer going to be there for the next three four quarters so most of their top line growth is actually going to come only from a volume growth perspective so we expect the growth to come off a little bit for a staples and we are moving more to the discretionary side because we believe that, you know, with the onset of the festive season, uh, we should start to see good amount of uptick on the discretionary side. So that's the nuance on the consumer discretionary. On the capital goods side, again, I think next year we get into the election mode. So what we are going to have is that, uh, you know, typically in an election year, we see that the execution actually takes a little bit of a backseat which will also get reflected in a bit of a lower order book from a this year perspective. So we should start to see some normalization on the capital good side. Credit remains in a good situation. You know, the ROEs of the banks remain pretty good. Uh, the asset quality still remains good. So credit is something that we are still positive on. Uh, here, we will probably like to, uh, you know, we are selectively uh, looking at, you know, some of the smaller banks also at this point of time and, you know, selectively some of the NBFCs. On the other sectors, pharma is something that we are overweight on. This is broadly uh, on the US side because we believe that a lot of uh, headwinds that the US pharma had, which was in terms of pricing pressure, which was in terms of input price pressure and number three, in terms of the US FDA uh, regulations, we are seeing on the margins, those headwinds are actually coming off. So the pricing pressure, you know, is used to have like 20, 22% kind of pricing cuts. 
which is now down to 5-7%. Now, 5-7% is something that the companies can live with. Similarly, on the input price, after the uh, China reopening, we are actually seeing that the input pricing are actually coming off. Right? So, clearly, we can see some of the tailwinds from a pharma perspective, particularly the US pharma. Domestic pharma, we are a little more, again, bottom-up. We like some of the companies where we believe that uh, which are playing very well in the consolidation story in India. So that's what we like on pharma. On the IT side, technology, we were underweight. We have brought it up to equal weight now. We will like to see a little more confidence coming in from the US before we decide to get into the overweight position on the uh, pharma side. Uh, Energy is something which, uh, uh, you know, again, uh, we like to play more through the gas companies in India rather than the oil companies. Uh, of course, OMCs probably will be in a bit of a tough position right now, given that, you know, we are just getting into a state elections and oil has already moved up to $90, $95. So that is a space which is avoidable for us. So, yeah, I think that's broadly how we look at this. Sure, sure. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, so, uh, just coming on to the next point, you are uh, coming up with the small cap NFO early next month. So, if you can just throw us some light on that NFO, how, how are you structuring the same? At, uh, how are you looking at the valuation part uh, and the deployment part in the small cap space? Great. So, See, when we talk about small cap uh, and small cap investing, if I were to summarize it in one sentence, uh, that what is small cap investing, I would say that it is about spotting Sachin Tendulkar at the age of 16. Right? You want to have something like a Sachin Tendulkar in your portfolio, which can play out for the next, you know, 5, 7, 10 years. Of course, Sachin Tendulkar, uh, you know, played for India for more than two decades. But characteristically, that's what you want, right? Uh, so, basically, when we put it in terms of numbers, clearly we can see that small cap as a category has been one of the best wealth creation category across time frames over the next last 5, 7, 10, 15, 20 years kind of a time frame, right? Of course, it comes with its own set of volatility also. And hence, an investor should be compensated with higher returns in a small cap category. But the key thing is that, again, I go back to the point of India being a growth market. Since India is a growth market, the opportunity for small caps is much, much higher in a market like India as compared to some of the developed markets. Uh, next slide. So, and I think this is something which is very important when we talk about, you know, uh, why small caps? Because the next one, yeah. So, when we look at, uh, you know, the, let's say, Nifty large cap, Broadly, three sectors account for 50% of Nifty. You have energy, you have financials, and you have IT. And 50-55% of the Nifty is done. Whereas a lot of emerging sectors, they are not represented in the large caps. They are represented in the small cap or mid cap. Right? So, for example, you know, think about EMS as a sector. Right? There was no EMS sector five or seven years ago, you know, Amber and Dixon got listed only, I think, in somewhere 2017 or 2016. Before that, there was nothing like an EMS sector. And now, you know, EMS sector has become a favorite because of all these PLI schemes and everything. Now, bulk of these companies are actually listed in the small cap. They are not large caps. So the thing is that, you know, small cap provides that opportunity to participate in the sectors which will become larger from a next 5, 7, 10 years perspective and which are underrepresented or not represented at all in a large cap kind of a time, uh, in a format. The next one.
and of course you know i think this is a very important point uh, because we know that you know smaller companies they are typically promoter driven uh, you know small companies small setup so you can't expect you know a whole lot of professionalism out there and hence a lot of uh, you know uh, the onus of the small company getting bigger lies on the promoter itself and hence it is important that the promoter skin in the game is significant so you know if i were to just put it more in terms of numbers what are we looking at from a small cap company what we are looking at is saying that you know a company which is let's say 5000 6000 crore market cap will probably become a 50000 crore market cap company in 10 years time now this journey of 5000 crore market cap to 50000 crore market cap who is the biggest beneficiary of that it's basically the promoter right so and if the promoter doesn't have a you know a bigger skin in the game then you know as a investor i cannot have a derived confidence right and hence this is a very important part when we look at a small cap uh, investing and this is just a mirror image of the first one given the fact that you know the promoter ownership is higher these are the companies which are far less discovered as compared to the large caps clearly the institutional holding is much lower and this exactly is what provides that opportunity for alpha generation i think this is a very important chart uh, because when we talk about uh, small cap investing and small cap as a universe it's very easy to you know put it like as a one aggregated uh, universe but the basic thing is that you know the companies and the nature of the companies is very varied in a small cap as compared to a large cap or a mid cap so when we look at a large cap and a mid cap now they are very tightly defined universe right a large cap is a 100 companies universe a mid cap is a 150 company universe but when we come to a small cap the small cap is basically anything below 17000 crore market cap correct so now as a house we look at companies let's say between 4000 to 17000 crore market cap that is a universe of some 300 companies now if we go below 2000 to 4000 crore there are another 200 companies so it's a far more varied space as compared to something like a large cap or a mid cap and hence it becomes a little erroneous to paint that entire you know universe with one brush and you know what this chart shows is the variation in the performance of the companies within the small cap universe so when you look at you know this chart basically shows the performance of the top 30% of the uh you know nsc small cap index over the last 5 years the average 5 year cagr return and the bottom 30% of so matlab jo top 75 companies hai and jo bottom 75 companies hai and you can see the difference in the performance of plus 35% and minus 4% what this means is that a small cap category is essentially a very very bottom of category the entire art of a small cap lies in what stocks we are owning rather than whether we are owning the small cap as a universe or not this is the crux of small cap investing right so and just to elaborate it on a little further if you can go to the next slide so we did a little further uh, insight into what explains this variation of performance of you know plus 35 and minus 4 so we analyzed the data over the last 18 years and what we found is that you know what explains best in terms of this variation is basically the earnings momentum so this is basically the performance of the companies which we divided it into five quintiles ranked on the growth the last 12 month growth rate in earnings so every quarter we will take the top 30 or top uh, you know yeah 50 companies 
in terms of the growth and we will accordingly have the Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4, Q5. Q1 having the best growth, Q5 having the worst growth. And this is rebalanced every quarter. And this we ran for the last 18 years. And you can see the difference in the returns. Right? The best ones have given 19 times and 17 times returns. While the worst in terms of growth, they are actually down by 76%. Think about it that in 18 year time kind of a time frame, you have companies which have given 19 time returns and you also have companies which have actually given minus 76% return. So this tells you the importance of stock picking bottom up approach in a uh, small cap. So like you asked rightly that, you know, why now from a valuation perspective, whether it looks uh, good, bad, ugly. Uh, so I think this is a very basic thing about, you know, a small cap return. You have two components. One is the P re rating. The second is the earnings growth. So now we will look at, you know, each one of those components, how they are stacking up at this point of time. So if you go to the next slide. Yeah, so this is the first component, which is the PE part of it. So yes, the PE is not cheap. You know, as a fund manager, I will love to buy companies at 8 times, 10 times PE. But that's not the case right now. But is the small cap universe significantly overvalued? The answer is no. As you can see from the chart on the top, the valuations are somewhere around the long-term average. So again, as I said earlier, also there will always be pockets of overvaluation. But does this mean that there are no opportunities in the small cap? Clearly the answer is no. Also, when we look at in the context of, you know, the premium or discount to Nifty, we can see that broadly it's trading at similar valuations to Nifty. So again, there are no broad brush overvaluation in this space. If we go a little deeper, if you go to the next slide, just to put it in terms of the numbers, as you can see that on FI25, the small cap universe is trading at 16.7 times for an expected growth of 16%. Again, mind you, this is an aggregate number. And remember what I said earlier that, you know, small cap is a very varied universe. So while 16% is an average CAGR earnings growth, there are going to be companies which will probably grow at 40-45%. Similarly, from a valuation, while the, you know, overall aggregate valuation is 16.7, there will be companies which probably will be trading at 30 times and there are going to be companies which are trading at 10 times. So it's, you know, within the universe rather than the universe itself, which is a very critical part from a small cap perspective. Now, this is a very important chart. Okay. Uh, I think that the top question in everybody's mind right now is that small cap has done very well over the last six months. So is there still enough juice left in the small cap category? So, you know, first we covered it from a fundamental point of view. And we saw that from a fundamental valuation perspective, there is no broad brush overvaluation. Now, we also look at from a little bit of a market perspective. So we identified, you know, five distinct small cap rallies in the last 18 years. And if you see the behavior of those rallies, typically those rallies have lasted anywhere between 579 to 740 days. Or let us say on an average somewhere around 21 months. And the returns... The absolute returns have been anywhere between 93% to 270%, depending on where you start the cycle. Now, put that in the context of the current cycle. We are just around 6 months into the current cycle as compared to an average 21 month. Also, 
the returns are 33% as compared to anywhere between 93 to 270%. Right? So, the thing is that either we can be satisfied and say that, okay, you know, we have made 33% return, 28% uh, um, you know, outperformance to Nifty uh, and I will take money home. Or you can also say that, you know, there is enough money is still left on the table. So, you know, in our investment world, we have a very uh, common or a popular saying that selling early is as much as a mistake as selling too late. Right? Ki agar, you know, I bought something in 50 rupees, and I think that it can be 500 rupees. Now, let us say, when that stock goes to 100 rupees, how should I look at it? Whether I should say, Are, you know, the stock is already doubled, maybe 100 can go to 90, I should take money home, and I should, re you know, look to re-enter at 90. Or should I say that, look, I don't know, yes, it can come down to 90 in the short term. I have no clue on that. But ultimately, I know that it will go to 500. So I might as well hold it, you know, because I think it will go to 500. Right? So I think that's the view one needs to take saying that, you know, like, yes. See, when we talk about these cycles of, you know, 21 month, it's not a linear cycle. There will be some pullbacks through that journey of 21 month. But we know that, you know, these rallies are typically that long lasting and intuitively a lot of us who have investing into the market we know that right that the returns particularly in equity market are punched up we talk about cagr returns but we know that you know a bulk of those returns come in a shorter period of time so you know if we know that we are in that cycle it makes a lot of sense to stay invested rather than trying to say that you know okay maybe there is going to be a five percent pullback i will try to invest at that point of time so that's the sum and substance that we are trying to portray and convey is that we believe that this cycle has legs both in terms of the time frame as well as in terms of the returns and it's too soon to say that the rally in a small cap is already done Absolutely, sir. Uh, so now, uh, thank you so much, sir, uh, um, for sharing uh, all the data points. Very insightful. Uh, so many insights we have got from these data points, and particularly while comparing uh, large caps with with small caps. Uh, now we would just invite uh, a few questions from our audience. Uh, so, uh, anyone can raise their hand or can just unmute themselves and ask a few questions and they can also write in the chat box. So, uh, any questions that we have from the audience? You were uh, mentioning about the pharma companies. Yes. Uh, can you brief a little bit more on that? Right. So, uh... The pharma companies, as I said, see, we are mostly positive, uh, more positive right now on the US uh, uh, facing pharma companies. So, which basically means, you know, most of the larger pharma names like Sun Pharma, Jidus, Cadilla, uh, Lupin, Redis, you know, the big five. So, I think, uh, you know, those are better placed at this point of time. On the domestic side, uh, some of the companies that we have liked for a long time, which form part of our portfolio are uh, companies like Torrent Pharma and JB Chemicals. Sure, sure. So, Shiv, uh, I have two, three questions. One is, uh, uh, you know, when it comes to small cap, the biggest challenge is uh, quantification of corporate governance. So, how do you do yes. that? That is first yes. question. Second is, uh, this is from the perspective of investors. Uh, so the first part of question is ki, how much tenure should one look at when investing into large, mid and small cap respectively, first thing. 
Second, from the perspective of an investor who is investing into, let's say, mutual funds only, mm. how should they mitigate risk associated with a small cap? Is Horizon the only tool available to them or they can also do something apart from Horizon Horizon to mitigate the you know volatility uh, linked with the investing into small cap mutual funds? Right. So I think, see, uh, you know, Particularly, the first question was a very good question around the corporate governance. Uh, and that is where, you know, I mentioned about the promoter holding, right? Uh, so when we talk about uh, investing in the Indian context, the promoter part is a very, very important part, right? Irrespective of the capital that we are talking about. And when we talk about a small cap, the import, importance just goes up, you know, three times or five times. Because like I said earlier that, you know, finally small cap companies are far more promoter driven uh, organizations. So it's very important to be fully convinced about the promoter part of it. And, uh, you know, that is where uh, what we like to talk about is what we call the necessary and the sufficient condition. The necessary condition in a small cap investing is that the business opportunity has to be large enough for that company to go from a small cap to a mid cap to a large cap. But the sufficient condition is that the management capability has to be there for that company to capture that particular opportunity. So now the key question comes in is that how does one evaluate that management capability, right? I mean, it's good to talk about it, but finally, how does one execute it? So I think how does one execute it is, uh, you know, or at least what we try to do is we try to do a lot of channel checks, a uh, lot of reference checks. Uh, we look at the companies and it's, it doesn't, it, or it seldom happens that, you know, we meet a company and then we immediately take a call. Uh, and some of us uh, in the investment team, you know, we have more than 20 years of experience in the industry. And, you know, we would have seen most of these companies in the past somewhere or the other. So we will have some kind of a background in terms of, you know, what these companies have done in the past, what the promoters have done, uh, you know, what is their lineage, are they related to some other industry house, things like that. Also, sometimes we do ask some uncomfortable questions to the management in terms of, you know, what is their family orientation, who, who all are involved in the family business, what are their other family businesses, so on and so forth. So the crux of the matter is that, uh, you know, small cap investing is something like, you know, just one notch above a private equity investment. And hence the amount of due diligence that is required is far, far detailed as compared to any other. And that's what we try to do when we are looking at a small cap uh, investment. Mm -hmm. Now yes. coming to your question, I think he had another question in terms of how to mitigate the risk on a small cap and what's the time horizon that one is looking at on large, mid and small okay. cap. So I think uh, number one, when we talk about equity as an investment class, uh, I think typically we talk about a minimum five year horizon across the board, irrespective of the cap curve that one is present. Now, coming to your question around, uh, you know, how do I mitigate a risk or the volatility on the small cap? So, I think, and I'm, I'm glad that you raised this point because volatility is part of a small cap investing. We cannot wish it away. It is going to be there. So, there are two ways in which this risk can be minimized or, you know, lowered. It cannot be mitigated. One is in the hands of the fund manager. So, you know, as a fund manager, what I will try to do is, you know, I will number one, have a diversified portfolio. Number two, I will have the quality of a portfolio, which is less susceptible to, you know, uh, or 
yeah, lower probability and lower impact in terms of volatility, which basically means that, you know, for leverage of the companies that we are going to have in the portfolio. And number three, of course, at some point of time, when we believe that the market is overvalued, we will have, you know, like we can be 65% in small caps, we can have a higher percentage of mid cap and large caps. So that is at a fund manager level. At an investor level, see, one of the things that investor can do or try to do is to maybe get into a flexi cap kind of a, um, you know, product. But typically, uh, you know, we don't advise that too much because again, you know, you are getting into a scenario where you are trying to time the market and you are saying that, ki, nahi, nahi, main abhi small caps se nikal jata hu. Uh, you know, I will come back, you know, when things are better, but it, it rarely happens in practice. These are good things to talk about from a, uh, you know, theoretical perspective, very hard to execute. So I think Thank the you. best part from an investor perspective is to, you know, evaluate their risk profile and say that, you know, given my risk profile, my risk appetite, what is a good quantum of a small cap exposure that I want to have? Absolutely. Absolutely. Sir. So the next question we have from Mr. Sanjeev Mittal, uh, he, he wants to ask what are EWS for this particular portfolio? EWS so, will be what? Uh, early warning signals. Ah, early warning signals uh, for the portfolio. Uh, so again, I think uh, early warning signals for a small cap is typically going to be, you know, so again, let, let's let uh, uh, dial back a little bit. Okay. Uh, and, uh, you know, it reminds me of a good example. I, I, you know, in the beginning, I talked about a small cap is all about trying to spot a Sachin Tendulkar at the age of 16, right? It is also about how can we avoid a Vinod Kambli, right? So I think, uh, you know, when we see uh, those kind of signs is when we will try to figure out that, okay, you know, probably it's a Vinod Kambli and it's not a Sachin Tendulkar. And, uh, you know, we need to get uh, out of it. But, you know, again, just to put it in a little bit of a more uh, serious note, I think, see, when we invest in a small cap, there is a basic thesis on which we are investing, right? We are investing in companies where we think that the business will escape in certain fashion. We are expecting certain events to take place. We are expecting the company to, you know, take certain measures over a period of time. And of course, you know, this is, and again, the monitoring part in a small cap is far more important and necessary as compared to a large cap and a mid cap, right? So the key part lies in the monitoring of it, that whether the story is panning out as per our expectations or not, or, you know, what we expected when we invested in that particular company. Now, of course, there can be a macro overlay on that. Either, you know, there can be a change in policy from a regulatory perspective where we need to take a fresh look and say that, okay, you know, does this business still make sense or not? Or there can be some temporary, you know, business cycle kind of a phenomenon. Now, the basic thing is that when we are investing in companies with a three, five year view, we do take into account the business cycles. And the key thing in a small cap is to say, see that whether this company can survive a down business cycle or not. Right? So, if the performance of the company is getting hit just because of an economic cycle, we will not be too worried because, you know, we believe that this company probably will come out only stronger after a down cycle. But if it is because of some other reasons, then of course, we will always take, you know, um, evaluate and say that, okay, probably 
do we need to reevaluate and do we need to take a fresh call? I hope I am able to answer your question. Yeah, uh, I hope sir, the uh, and your question is answered. Uh, Sanjeev sir is uh, is our, my senior from IIT Roorkee and is also the head of Scotia Bank country head of Scotia Bank. So I hope sir, the question is answered. Yeah. Uh, so we have uh, uh, the next question from Mr. Ankur Tayal. Uh, there are a few small cap companies in the media sector. So what is your view on this particular sector? So again, I think, um, you know, historically, if you look at uh, media as a sector has not been one of uh, the happy hunting grounds from an investor perspective. Uh, if you look at from a longer term perspective of last 18, 20 years or even 30, 25 years, uh, investors have not made a whole lot of money when it comes to media sector. Uh, having said that, we do like the movie exhibition business. Uh, we believe that, uh, you know, that's a business which has, uh, you know, in spite of whatever we see on the OTT and things like that, um, we do believe that uh, the movie exhibition business in India does have a future and it's more of a function of the content rather than, you know, just a suffer across platforms. So, you know, that's something that we like, but particularly when it comes to uh, the production part on the media side, that is something that we avoid uh, because we, again, you know, that's a very highly volatile business, very unpredictable. And uh, we don't think that, you know, that's a great business to be as an investor. Sure. Sure. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, we would just take uh, one more question. Uh, and as we have overshooted the time, sure. uh, we have a question on from Mr. Uh, Mr. Patro. Uh, is, he is asking view on geo financial services, but I believe you cannot take any stock specific questions. Uh, but uh, but your take on on the financial services uh, and uh, as a whole. So I think financial services as a sector we are fairly positive uh, because I think uh, you know what we call the financialization of savings is just about starting in India and. You know, you guys are doing a great uh, job and a big contribution towards that. Uh, so clearly, I think there is a very big future from a financialization perspective. Uh, but here, I will say that, you know, when we talk about the financials and the space, one thing that all of us should look at is what are those companies doing on the technology side? Because, see, unlike in the past, the new reality is this, that in the past, IT and technology used to be a backend, a support system. Now, technology and IT is at the center and the business is built around technology and IT. So, any company, any organization which is not investing in technology is going to be left behind. And companies which are using technology to build their businesses and to power their businesses, those are the companies who are going to be probably the winners. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Uh, I and thank you so much for such insightful views on the markets. Um, my particular favorite on the data for points that you showed on the valuations. Um, thank you everyone for joining in the session on this uh, on Saturday uh, uh, and we wish to uh, we will release with our a note on this particular NFO to our clients uh, and thank you thank you everyone thanks thanks thank you very thank insightful you. thank you thanks a lot thanks Aditya for organizing this and thanks everybody uh, for sparing time on a uh, Saturday and uh, everyone have a very good weekend Thank you.